as much as our messianic expectation as a people is that the Messiah would come as the King of Kings, when God was our King, we found it hard to submit to his leadership. So as much as we want it, maybe we don't so much. And that then gets back to what was Jesus' mission? Because he couldn't come as the reigning king until he could bring about a transformation, created the desire in a heart that was made flesh instead of stone. Welcome to A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your co-host, Carly Berna. And I'm Ezra Benjamin. We're a Jew and a Gentile who both believe in Jesus and believe that there's value in looking at history as well as today's world in the headlines through both a Jewish and a Christian lens. If you clicked on this episode, it might be because you saw the title, Did Jesus Fail? And you might be wondering, fail what? Which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. What was Jesus' mission and did he succeed? But before we get started, we want to remind you, as always, that you can help support us and Jewish communities around the world living in very remote areas of the world that you may have never heard of. Um, We bring humanitarian aid as well as share the gospel with them. There's more details on our website, ajewandagentiledisgust.org. And as a thank you, if you support us in this way, we will send you some coffee directly from Ethiopia called the Lost Tribes Coffee. Um, where we have served for over 20 years. So if you stay tuned to the end of this podcast, you can win a chance to get that coffee for free as well. So let's discuss. So Ezra, the question, did Jesus fail, obviously depends on the answer to what was his mission. Sure. I think from the Christian perspective, Jesus came to save the world. Uh, Someone might look in and say, well, he came and then he was he died on a cross Mm -hmm. and so you know maybe that was his defeat he he didn't really do anything um and so did he actually succeed the other part i would say just bringing in the jewish uh perspective that we want to look at is he came and he claimed that the jews were his chosen people but he didn't save them while he was here on earth right and so i think we we got to start right there um because again, as we say so often in these episodes of a, of a Jew and a Gentile discuss, we have to make sure we're even having the same conversation, right? And the, the question of failure, as you said, depends on mission. So here's an example, okay? I'm thinking of somebody comes to my house and they fix 10 burnt out lights. Okay, not that this is happening right now in the house my wife and I are trying to get together. Anyway, but they come and they fix 10 lights, right? They get up on the ladder and they fix them and they weren't working and now they're working. And at the end, everybody goes, wow, that was so wonderful. This is great. What an electrician. They fixed, they saved you from your electrical problems. And I go, yeah, but the problem is I called a plumber. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. See, my toilet's backing up, and it's still backing up. And I didn't need an electrician, right? So it's all, what was the mission, right? If we don't define the mission, then who can say whether the person or whether the the, uh, person in question succeeded or failed in the mission? Who needs an electrician if what you really need is a plumber? And like you said, I think, you know, in in Christian thought, Jesus, correct me if I'm misunderstanding here, right, is— is primarily seen as a personal savior, right? Jesus came and he died on a cross and he took the punishment for my sins and the wages of that sin was death and so Jesus tasted death so I don't have to. Mm -hmm. And so then we can read that back as believers in Jesus as our savior, as the Messiah and go, well, of course his mission was to Uh, save me from my sins, and he absolutely did, and I'm forgiven, and I have a clean conscience, so he succeeded, right? But we're actually looking backwards through our own salvation experience, right? Through our own uh, confidence in the Lord that we've been forgiven from our sins. Now we got to look from a Jewish perspective, which was looking at the Messiah forward throughout history from Moses. Moses, who, you know, is, is this great figure in Judaism, one of the greatest who's ever walked on earth, right? He, he walked us from slavery through to, to freedom and deliverance, walked us to the edge of the promised land, even though we couldn't go in. But Moses says, another prophet greater than I is coming, listen to him. So Moses looked ahead to a Messiah who he understood would be a great prophet. The prophets looked ahead to a Messiah who, who 
uh, would rule and reign over the kingdoms of the earth. David gets this word about his own kingship uh, when he's found to be a man after God's own heart. And God says to him, one in your line will reign on your throne and his kingdom will have no end. Okay, and it was understood, of course, this is going to be, it's what we say in Hebrew is the Mashiach ben David. And what that means is the Messiah, son of David. And it literally means one in David's line, like David gets this word from, from the Lord through, through a prophetic voice, one in your line will have a kingdom which will never end. But it's also symbolic of the idea that the Messiah, as we looked forward through history expecting the Messiah to come, would be one who would rule and reign. His government would have no end. We see it in Isaiah, actually, Isaiah 9. It says, and you shall call his name Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting God, uh, Prince of Peace. And it says, uh, and and the, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and of the increase of his authority and rule there shall be no end. Okay, this was the messianic expectation. This still is the messianic expectation in much of Jewish thought, is the idea of the mission of the Messiah was to come and to rule and to reign. And even more so, including in Jesus' time, as there was no king in Israel, and the people of Israel were subject to the... uh, authority and often the superstition or the tax over taxation or systematic persecution of governments and authority over them uh, they were expecting the messiah not only to be a king forever but also to be a liberator of the jewish people to restore the kingdom to israel and where did i get that language actually not just from the old testament prophets actually from the disciples in acts one right jesus dies he resurrects and they say okay good that, that, you know, that they appreciate that he died and that he, he walked out of the grave and conquered death. And what's their question? And th- this, lets, this, this gives us a window into first century believers' messianic expectation. Will you at this time, O Lord, restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? Everything about messianic expectation or the understanding of the mission of the Messiah in Israel was building up to this idea that he would come, he would restore the kingdom to Israel, he would set right what's been done in injustice and unrighteousness, Uh, he would restore this political reign in Israel which would extend over the kingdoms of the earth. So that was sort of how you looked at messianic expectation throughout history. And in that sense, the idea of the Messiah dying, right, like being stripped naked and beaten by Roman authorities and then taking his last breath hung on some wooden beams outside the city next to a bunch of criminals, you can understand how apart from the testimony of his resurrection, which was witnessed by hundreds and we, hundreds, and we can't forget that, apart from that, how could this be the ruling king, right? How could this be the Messiah, son of David, if he's dying naked on a tree? That's part of the problem. Yeah, it's interesting because when in the beginning when you were talking about Jesus dying on the cross, I was thinking that actually was part of his success. He came and that's the way that he gave us salvation. He died for our sins. So right. from a Christian perspective, Jesus dying on the cross wasn't defeat. It was part of his success. Yeah. And he's not done. Like if right. you read the Bible, we're partway through the story. Right. But from the messianic expectation – that was failure from what they thought would happen. They didn't think he would come and be stripped naked and be dying on a cross. In a sense, yes. But here's where let's try to get closer to the aisle where we can have one conversation. And what I mean by that is as much as the messianic expectation in Judaism is the Messiah, son of David, there's also this concurrent idea called Mashiach ben Yosef, which is Messiah, son of Joseph. What does that mean? It's this idea of one who would be persecuted by his brothers and sent to suffer by his brothers, but also sent to suffer for his brothers, so that just like Joseph went ahead and it says, it was for the preservation of life in Israel that all of this harm has befallen me. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good so that we can be alive and thrive as it is this day. There's this messianic expectation as well, though it's a lot less glamorous and less talked about, Carly, in Jewish thought, that the Messiah would also be a suffering servant Mm -hmm. who would in essence be persecuted, caused to suffer by, but even more importantly, for the people of Israel to preserve life. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the idea of Joseph in the scriptures. We also see this in a rarely read passage in the Old Testament from Isaiah 53. 
right? Who has believed our report, it says, right? And to whom is the arm of the Lord? Who has God's power been revealed to? And it talks about one who would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows well acquainted as grief. And Isaiah is saying, and we, Israel, hid our faces from this one. We couldn't bear to look at this man. He was disfigured more than any man, it says. And then that famous passage that Christians love to quote and sing about, and proclaim in prophetic worship services, not, not untrue, but the Jewish community has a real hard time grappling with. And it says, by his stripes we were healed, right? Um, uh, he was pierced for our iniquities and bruised for our, bruised for our iniquities and pierced for our transgressions. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. By his stripes we are healed. So right away we can say, wait a minute, bruising, piercing, stripes, like whip marks, this is clearly Jesus. Right. This is clearly one whose suffering brings us healing. But how do you reconcile that with a ruling and conquering Messiah King who would restore the kingdom to Israel? This is the big problem in Jewish thought. And so while many, even in Israel, there was this campaign a few years ago where this guy went around and had uh, Israelis read Isaiah 53 in Hebrew, religious, non-religious, secular, whatever. And he said, read it out loud. He was pierced for our iniquities. He was bruised for our transgressions. And they said, who did you think of? The guy said, who do you think of? And so many people clearly said, oh, it's Jesus. Like it's Jesus in the Old Testament. But it's so scandalous. And I don't think I'm overusing that word. It's scandalous to say the one we expected to be the Messiah would actually have to be bruised, striped, and pierced for us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can Messiah ben David, Messiah son of David, and Messiah son of Joseph uh, be the same person? Can the ruling and conquering king be the same one as the suffering servant? And this is the, this is the difficulty with recognizing Jesus' death as actually a part of his mission. And yet, if we look at Jesus' own admission of his mission, okay, I'm thinking of a passage in uh, Matthew 15, right? Jesus is, is th this woman, this Gentile woman, not part of the people of Israel, comes and says, my daughter's sick, would you heal her, right? And Jesus says, I haven't come except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? He's saying, my mission is Israel, but not he, says, he doesn't say, I haven't come except to restore the kingdom to Israel. He says, I've come for the lost sheep. Is that just Jesus' own poetic language of a way of turning this, this uh, Gentile woman down for ministry? No, he's pulling on Ezekiel. He's pulling on Jeremiah. He's pulling on Micah, all of whom who said that a shepherd would come for the sheep of the house of Israel. And Jesus is saying, my mission right now is to regather lost sheep. Because there's more joy in heaven over one sheep who's regathered than over 99 who are fine and don't need a shepherd. So Jesus doesn't say, even in Acts 1, right? Is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He, he doesn't say, no, you idiots. I'm not restoring any kingdom. It was all about personal redemption. He says, it's not for you to know the time the Father's put in his own authority when I'll restore the kingdom to Israel. I'm giving you a different power right now, and it's to be my witnesses because my redemption and regathering of lost sheep isn't only for Israel, it's for all people's tribes and tongues on the face of the earth. And it begins here in Jerusalem. Do you think, I know your upbringing was a little different than most Jewish sure. people who come to know Jesus, as we've talked about in other right. episodes. But is this suffering servant idea one of the biggest barriers to a Jewish person accepting Jesus? Because they think he's going to come as this king and, and rule, and then they see this guy supposedly the Messiah died on a cross and was whipped and all of that. Right. I think it is, that is part of the objection. And it's, it's, I think Christians understand this almost as second nature because it's built into a Christian worldview, right? Yeah. Jesus came and he's coming again. Mm -hmm. And in Jewish thought, we struggle with this idea of a Messiah who's a suffering servant and a conquering king, but it's not explicitly said in the Old Testament scriptures that the Messiah would come a second time. And so what we have to go on are the promises of the script of who the Messiah would be, according to Moses and the prophets, Jesus' own resurrection from the dead that confirms his authority over sin and death, mm -hmm. and then his own words and the testimony of John on Patmos in the book of Revelation that Jesus would come, that the Messiah would come again to rule and reign over the kingdoms of the earth. Okay, so we, we, we have to put all of that together, but it's not immediately clear where we can make this scriptural proof that the Messiah would have to come twice. Mm -hmm. And so here we are in the in-between 
where it's second nature for a Christian worldview and it's scandalous or how could it be true from a Jewish perspective. Mm-hmm. Why do you think or what's your perspective on Jesus came, he declares yeah. the Jewish people as his chosen people, right. but it even says in the Bible that you know it's harder for them to see him as the Messiah and accept him. Why would he make the people that he declares as his chosen people, why would he make it even harder for them? I think you know there's a couple thoughts. One is that we see throughout the scripture, um, I'm thinking of Isaiah actually, there's this passage in Isaiah 6 where, and we, you know, many from a Christian background know the passage, but not the context, right? It says, whom shall I send, God's saying. You know, Isaiah sees the Lord in glory during a dark time in Israel's history. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says that famous thing, here am I, Lord, send me. And God says, okay, go with this message. And the message is, keep on, this is to Israel. Go to Israel with this message. Keep on hearing, but don't hear. And keep on seeing, but you're not going to see. Because if you did, I would heal you. And that, unfortunately, is part of this, if you will, condition of Israel. I'm speaking as a part of the people of Israel now. A condition of our people that God says, you're the most stiff-necked and stubborn-hearted people on the face of the earth, but I love you and I'm going to keep my promises. And if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you'll believe what I said is true and I'll heal you and I'll redeem you and I'll restore you. But for most of history and most of you won't do it. Even Paul talks about this idea, right? Even to this day, it says when the book of Moses is read, he's not even talking about the testimony of Yeshua, of Jesus. He's saying to this day, when the Torah is read, when the Jewish scriptures are read to the Jewish people, a veil remains over our eyes so that we can't see. This hardness in part has happened to our people. But that, to answer your question, Carly, there is a why. It doesn't say blindness or callousness of heart or hardness of heart in part has happened to Israel because God wants to punish us and because we're just a difficult people. And he says, so there. It says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That God in his providence has actually, through the stubbornness of the people of Israel whom he loved first, made a way for redemption and forgiveness of sins and a belief in the coming king of Israel and the king of all the nations of the earth to be proclaimed and received by a remnant from every people, tribe, and tongue. And it says when, that full, when God has what he's after from the nations, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, this is from Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. Now, does that mean every single Jewish person who's ever lived? Does that mean it's going to happen in a moment? Does it mean right before Jesus comes back, when he comes back? I, I can't say. I think, you know, you, we could debate that for hours. But what we know is Romans 11 ends in saying God's bound all men, Jew and Gentile, over to disobedience. And that's true of the Jewish people too. We hear the scriptures, Old Testament or the gospel, the, the proclamation of the Messiah, and we, we turn away. We don't receive it. And it says so that he could have mercy on us all. So somehow in the providence of God, he, he gives Israel, he gives the Jewish people over for a time in part to hard-heartedness, to callousness, to disobedience because he's after something through our rejection unto the salvation of the world, but he's a promise-keeping God and says, but make no mistake, I'll have what I want from Israel too Mm -hmm. because I died for it. Mm -hmm. I, the suffering servant, came on mission for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and because I so loved the world. And by my death and resurrection, I'll get what I'm after. I'll get a fullness from every people, tribe, and nation, and tongue. And I'll get the salvation of Israel, my people, because I promised I would, despite their unbelief in their behavior. So there's multiple verses in the Bible that talk about the veil being over the eyes of the Jewish people. Are you saying that um, he put the veil over the eyes of the Jewish people because of their stubbornness? It's, in a way, chicken or egg. Does God cause people to unbelief? I mean, we see he hardened Pharaoh's heart. I don't think you can apply that to Israel, the Jewish people. He had a specific uh, judgment and redemptive purpose in hardening Pharaoh's heart. But I think that part of the human condition, right, since Adam, is to turn away from God and say, you will not rule over me. Jew and Gentile alike, there's no difference. The Mm -hmm. the scriptures are clear. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And does God then 
give us over to that condition of our heart in part? Yeah, he may. Does he cause us not to believe? I can't say that for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think he points out in the Old Testament and the New Testament writings that there's this condition with Israel of being a bit uh, stubborn and hard-hearted in submitting to him. And so there again is this messianic idea, right? This idea of as much as our messianic expectation as a people is that the Messiah would come as the king of kings. When God was our king, we found it hard to submit to his leadership. So as much as we want it, maybe we don't so much. Mm -hmm. And that then gets back to what was Jesus' mission? Because he couldn't come as the reigning king until he could bring about through his death and resurrection and through the forgiveness of sins and through helping people to be born a second time by the Spirit of God, not just by the waters of birth, until he could bring about a transformation on the inside of a Jewish man or woman, or a Gentile for that matter, right? Until he could bring about a transformation that didn't just give lip service to wanting a king to rule and reign over us, but actually created the desire in a, in a heart that was made flesh instead of stone, mm-hmm. right? That's what he's, Jesus says, you know, in that Last Supper, which becomes communion in the church, but it's this Passover meal. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And Jeremiah says, the day is coming when I'd make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Jacob, not like the covenant I gave their fathers, which was written on tablets of stone, but I'll actually write my law on the tablets of human hearts. So I would say Jesus fulfilled his mission, but not as Israel understood he needed to. Because if Jesus came as the ruling and conquering king, Carly, to an unredeemed Israel whose hearts were still stony, who still viewed God's laws as on tablets of stone not written on their hearts, even the Messiah himself, we couldn't have received him. We would have turned our back again. And so he said, I'm coming to bring you a transformation to cause you to have new life and a genuine desire for my rulership, my kingship, my leadership. And when you cry out for me, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and welcome me coming as king with sincere hearts, not of unbelief, but of belief, then I'll come. Mm -hmm. So Jesus fulfilled his mission. He didn't fail, but he did something deeper than maybe most Jewish people understood needed to happen. And it was to change the condition of the human heart, not just to change the reality of the kingdoms of, of the earth. Mm-hmm. Second Corinthians does a good job of explaining the the veil over the their eyes, and you know when it's removed, the transformation. Which, you know, I was I was thinking about asking you, you know, what is it like when a Jewish person receives Jesus? But as a Christian, for someone who receives Jesus, it also is transformative. Right. It's not only for a Jewish person exactly um, receiving Jesus. Um, so, from a secular Jewish perspective, Jesus failed because he's not the way that they think that he should be. Because if he was the Messiah, where's the peace on earth and goodwill towards men and where's the ruling and conquering king from Jerusalem? Exactly. Right. From a Christian perspective, we're still in the midst of the story. He came and offered salvation um, for people to choose that. He didn't want to force people to, um, you know, follow that way. Uh, But for the Jewish people, they were stubborn hard-hearted, like you said, and it's like he took that and made an even better story out of it. Right. And we're still watching it unfold, like you said, the messianic expectation. Exactly, exactly. We've seen the Messiah come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to be not only the high priest, Hebrews says, but also himself the sacrifice, his own blood on an altar in heaven uh, to satisfy God's righteous demand for blood for in, in payment for sin. Mm-hmm. But we're still waiting for that day when he will come to rule and reign. And what's our assurance that he will? It's that he walked out of the grave. And I think that's, that's a key here. As much as we're talking about Jesus' death here and that being a failure, if Jesus wouldn't have walked out of the grave in a resurrected body, which was witnessed by hundreds, the scriptures are very careful to say, then it would have been a failure. Because if he didn't walk out of the grave, we would have no confidence in his authority to forgive sins Mm -hmm. and to die once and for all for sins. But his conquering of death confirms his authority to forgive sin 
and to be greater than death, to bring resurrection. And if he can do that, and the last enemy, the greatest enemy mankind's ever known is, is death, that we would all die in Adam. If he's bigger than that, then he's bigger than the kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. And if he said he's coming back, we have every reason to believe he will because he's already done the greater thing. He not only gave us the choice to choose salvation or not, um, but I also think we're part of this story. He gave us the empowerment to go out and share the gospel with people around us, Jewish people around us. Right. It's not like we just sit back and say, okay, we just wait now for the right. Jewish people or Gentiles to accept Jesus until he comes back. Right. That's exactly. part of our calling as well. Exactly. And so my encouragement to our listeners, if you're Jewish, you have a Jewish background, and when you hear Jesus, you hear God of the Christians, failed Messiah, no way, look again at the whole, at the entirety of messianic expectation in our own scriptures. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Christian listening, going, well, I just don't know how you know I can even discuss the idea of Messiah with a Jewish person, there's so much hostility, understand that the, that the narrative exclusively of personal savior and individual pocket-sized redeemer doesn't necessarily resonate with a Jewish person who's looking for a Messiah, King of David who's gonna rule and reign forever. Mm -hmm. So how do we have one conversation where we come a little bit farther than our own upbringing or cultural cues or what we've been told that we should say or believe uh, bring us? Yeah, something you said at the beginning of this episode just it makes me think about this this whole season. Actually, Ezra, this is our last episode of this season, but you talked about how we often look at things backwards mm -hmm. through our view and instead we need to look at them forwards and I can think of many episodes this season where we talked about that yep. that we're looking at something and making our judgment from what we can see now not going back into that context of what they knew and looking forward exactly exactly so for those listening I hope this was helpful like I just said this is our last episode um, if you haven't listened to the other episodes this season um, go check those out until the next season, but um, one of my favorites was Is Adam Jewish? Right. It's a good one. Um, it's meaty. Yep. So if you've missed any of those, go check those out um, as we close this season. Thanks for listening this season. Uh, we love hearing your feedback. We love seeing your comments on social media. Um, please send in your questions if you uh, have any questions or comments of what we've talked about for, for future episodes and future seasons. Um, if you want to hear more episodes, subscribe wherever you get this podcast and leave us a review that helps us share the podcast um, to others. And as I mentioned at the top of the episode, you can enter for a chance to win uh, the Lost Tribes coffee for free at a Jew and a Gentile .org. You can also um, purchase some of that coffee there as well. Um, thanks again for listening to A Jew and a Gentile Discuss, and we'll see you in, on a future season. The show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International. <laughs>